Good morning and welcome. Uh, welcome attendees uh, and panelists and folks on the live stream to the New America Foundation. For those who don't know me, uh, I am, as of uh, two weeks ago, the new policy director at the Open Technology Institute here at New America Foundation. Uh, if you're not familiar, New America is a nonpartisan think tank that invests in new thinkers and new ideas to address the next generation of challenges facing the United States, both domestically and internationally. Our experts work on a wide range of issues, including education, national security, technology policy, telecom policy. And at the Open Technology Institute, we bring together policy experts, technologists, and practitioners to tackle challenges uh, like promoting ubiquitous, safe, and affordable access to communications technologies in communities in the United States and around the world. Today's topic is central to OTI's mission. We are here today to talk about access to personal communications tools in some of the most repressive countries in the world, uh, Iran, Sudan, Syria, Cuba, and North Korea, and how US sanctions impact ordinary citizens' ability to talk to each other and to access unfiltered information. On one hand, today's event is the culmination of nearly a year's worth of work on the issue, uh, much of which has taken place behind the scenes in private meetings with government officials, tech companies, and of course, uh, human rights activists and civil society advocates. At the same time, though, we hope that this will be the beginning of a more public conversation about how US policies can be strengthened to reflect and promote the values of internet freedom in sanctioned countries. Yesterday, we released a new report Translating Norms to the Digital Age, Technology and the Free Flow of Information Under U.S. Sanctions. And that paper looks at the growing trend of authorizations that make it legal for American companies to export uh, their personal communications technologies and tools to countries that are subject to comprehensive U.S. sanctions. Today, we're going to talk about some of the observations we made in that report and the recommendations we put together for creating better policies going forward. The discussion is going to focus mostly on Iran, which has the most mature technology carve-outs right now, and on Sudan, where nonviolent protesters are increasingly relying on digital tools to communicate and organize, an indication that now could be the time for a policy shift geared toward helping the Sudanese citizens and increasing pressure on that regime. So our panelists, uh, they bring in a mix of experience and perspectives from the situation on the ground in Iran and Sudan to the regulatory challenges and the risk that companies face when they're trying to navigate these sanctions regimes. Uh, so a few housekeeping items. First, today's event is being live streamed and a recording of the panel will be available on the New America website after the event. Uh, also, for those of you in the room and watching online, we'd encourage you to continue the discussion on Twitter using the hashtag tech sanctions. Um, with those housekeeping things out of the way, uh, let me turn things over to our moderator, uh, OTI Program Associate Danielle Keel, who, along with OTI Policy Analyst Tim Marr, who is joining us in the back of the room, uh, and intern Sonia Fien, who could not join us today, uh, authored the paper we released today. On a personal note, I just want to say I'm very excited to be working with such a great team who, based on just a couple of weeks of experience, I expect will continually be making me look really good by virtue of the incredible work that they're producing. Um, so please, I invite you to join me in thanking them and crediting their hard work and joining me in welcoming our panelists today. Thanks. All right. <clears throat> um, thank you for that introduction, Kevin. And uh, first, I want to echo the warm welcome to everybody uh, here in the room and as well as those who are watching us. Uh, always on the live stream. Um, uh, we're really glad to have you here. Um, uh, also, a big s note of thanks, and you'll see this in the paper and the acknowledgments and um, on the website, which is that uh, while Tim and Sonia and I, you know, uh, put together this report, it's certainly something that couldn't have, we would never have been able to put together without uh, incredible contributions from a number of different people, and that's folks uh, in the government who, who gave us really good feedback and advice, as well as civil society advocates and human rights activists um, and uh, representatives of companies. And a lot of those, a lot of you are in the room today, so I want to thank you, um, especially for your work, for reading drafts, for everything that you did. Um, so thank you. Um, and with that, uh, I'll do a brief introduction, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. Um, as, as Kevin explained, uh, the topic that we're talking about today is, a, is both a complicated one and I think a very important one. Um, broadly, the issue is about uh, the ability of people in sanctioned countries, in repressive countries, and really all, all over the world uh, to communicate and to access information. Um, and increasingly, that requires the ability to access digital tools and personal communications technology. 
Um, so over the past year here uh, at OTI, we've been uh, focusing on the impact of sanctions on people's access to these tools. Um, a lot of that work, uh, as Kevin alluded to, has been the necessary outreach to the government officials, to representatives of companies, um, and to, of course, you know, civil society advocates to really try to get to understand the nuances. Um, and in the report, we, we take a look at uh, our sanctions policies through um, and the communications exemptions through the lens of what we consider to be a similar process of targeted sanctions reform in the 1990s. Um, and the goal of this, this idea of targeted sanctions is to maximize the cost of um, sanctions to the target regime, so, so to put pressure on the regime while minimizing the unintended negative consequences on the population. Um, that's one of the reasons why today we have carve-outs for humanitarian goods like food and medicine in our sanctions programs. Um, so looking at the evolution of the authorizations for communications tools uh, over the past few years, uh, we see a similar trend. Um, what began with references to internet freedom uh, and exemptions for informational materials has evolved into a much more mature system of authorizations for personal <coughs> communications tools. Uh, this is particularly true when you look at Iran. Um, that's why that's one of the focuses of what we're going to discuss today. Um, at the same time, not all our sanctions programs are not, none of our sanctions programs are the same. Uh, and so in the report, we also examine the provisions that exist for Syria, for Sudan, for Cuba, and North Korea. Um, what we found is a patchworks, patchwork of complex provisions uh, that are often unclear, and they, they make it difficult even for the companies that really want to make their products available, that are trying to do the right thing and to, to you know, promote access and the free flow of information to make their products available to unblock them in these countries. Um, so we laid out a series of, of recommendations that we've developed over the past few months, um, not only to the U.S. government, but also to private companies and, of course, civil society, for how to strengthen and institutionalize the previous efforts. At the center of the proposal is the extension of general licenses to the other sanctioned countries. Um, and it's based on the precedent that was established uh, in General License D for Iran, which was issued in May of 2013. Um, there's really no reason why U.S. sanctions should be inadvertently doing the work of repressive governments, which is what they do now at times when, they, uh, when, when you see uh, access to information and communications tools restricted because companies aren't sure uh, if, they can, if they can export their products. Um, and we really think that there's a clear trend and a, a solid template for policy shift. Um, the general licenses, though, of course, are just a first step. Uh, and as we've learned over the past few years, even once the policies are in place, good and well-intentioned policies, um, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Companies need to understand them, uh, make sure that the, pro the products that they're trying to make available comply, um, and then they actually have to take ac active steps to implement it. Um, and of course, since we're talking about technology, uh, these are policies that have to be flexible. Uh, in a few years, we'll be facing, I'm almost certain, a different technological reality. And so we need to um, be able to, uh, to update re regulation and to, uh, to make changes that are appropriate. So anyway, I won't bore you too much more with, uh, with the rest of the, with the details of what's in the report. I hope you'll all t read it. Um, and we've got a great panel here today, so I'm eager to let them uh, let them talk. Um, so I'll introduce everyone briefly, and then they can tell you a little bit more about why they're here. Um, first, we have uh, Ian Schuler. Um, Ian is the founder of the New Rights Group, um, and he's the former <coughs> senior manager of Internet Freedom Programs at the U.S. Department of State. Uh, next to Ian, we've got uh, Colin Anderson. Um, I think many of you know Colin, um, who's an internet researcher with a wide range of expertise. Um, but one of the areas that Colin focuses on is Iran. Um, and so he can tell you about all things Iranian sanctions, but also Sudan sanctions, Cuban sanctions, Syrian sanctions. Don't want to don't put him in a box there. Uh, um, uh, next, we have uh, Brad Brooks Rubin. Uh, Brad is an attorney at Holland and Hart, um, and he specializes in trade sanctions, export controls, and international trade law. Um, he's a former attorney advisor to the US Department of Treasury. Uh, and a former special advisor for conflict diamonds with the U.S. Department of State. Um, and last but not least, we have um, Anwar Dafala, um, who is an assistant professor of computer science. Uh, he's the founder of TEDx Khartoum uh, and the founder of Nafir IT. Uh, and I will, with that, I will let them get to it. Ian, you want to? Sure. <coughs> well, 
Um, yeah, Danielle asked us to each give you guys some idea of why you should care what we're, why we're, that we're here at all and, and what our background is on the topic. Uh, myself, I was at the state, as Danielle mentioned, I was at the State Department between early 2011 and early 2013. At that time, I was working at DRL, the Bureau for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, on internet freedom issues during the uh, Clinton uh, State Department. The uh, time I was there, I was f primarily focused on programs, but sanctions was one issue. While I was not on the policy team, that well, there was one er issue where I was involved in working on our, our policies at the time. So I came in after the initial state, uh, general license for Iran, Cuba, and Sudan that was issued in 2010, but was involved in the process of writing uh, or the process of crafting interpretive guidance and a statement of licensing policy in, two, in March 2012 uh, around Nehru's at the time, and then was involved in some of the early formulations of what might be appropriate for General License D, although much of the heavy lifting on that policy move was, took place after I left. So that's by way of background. I, mean, I guess before we kind of kick it off into question, a few fr things I would say. Uh, one, I guess, quick point for, as far as framing is that I do think that there is certainly an interest in getting sanctions policy right and a recognition that it is something that constantly needs to be looked at and reformed. I think the barriers within government to getting uh, the policy changed are not necessarily uh, a lack of uh, any sort of interest that's trying to keep it the way that it is uh, or uh, and not necessarily a um, a, a disagreement with the notion that uh, access to, to communications and, and information is incredibly important, something that we should be, for individuals in sanctioned countries is important, and something that we should be supporting. There, you know, again, in the time that I was there, there was a, a clear uh, recognition of that as, a, as a, a policy issue that we wanted to pursue. But more, uh, the, the barriers tend to be that sanctions are so complicated that there's a lot of very specific technical information about the, the technologies themselves that are involved, what's currently accessible and what is not, and for what reason, uh, and what are the legal instruments available to change the, the way that, thing, that things are being done currently. And uh, frankly, for a lot of that information, we really relied on people outside of the government to provide that information. So that's an important thing for civil society to be doing and, f and companies to be doing, and, 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 and why I was very happy to be part of this meeting today and to see the report come out, because that was in incredible, uh, incredibly important in driving that sort of change. And then the other part is, you know, and often the, <coughs> the, the, the insti there are many uh, levers in government that need to be moved in order to move something uh, that touches as many things as sanctions and export control policy uh, uh, are involved in. And so getting everybody aligned to make the changes that they need to make does sometimes require a push. Uh, when all of these people are putting out a lot of fires, it's easier for, uh, to get the attention uh, to, for those who are interested in, in making these changes to get the momentum that they need if there is a bit of an external push as well. And so I do think that you will find, uh, find uh, fertile ground for making change, these sorts of changes, but, uh, but you may need to be the engine behind some of those movements. <coughs> So, I think I think what's ne necessary is perhaps an introduction to the role that sanctions play, and then to sort of walk from there to some of the legal responses that have happened and some of the ways in which we have a status in this field. Because I, I, I think I think what's easy to miss is that we have this romantic notion of the role that technology plays in countries that are undergoing either democratic transitions or internal political conflict particularly given uh, in the context of Iran. I think we, we had, particularly because of the mass media and the perception that happened in the, the, the Western press, this notion that, that 2009's uh, post-election demonstrations in, in regard to uh, allegations of electoral fraud were a Twitter revolution. But if we start to peel back and, and look at that notion, and look at the technologies involved, we see exactly for one why it, why it was not exactly that. Because if you look at that time in, in 2009, a vast majority of the, the resources and technologies that we hold up as, as being critical were blocked by one or of two sources. 
either the Iranian government or U.S. policy at the time. If, if we start to take a look, for example, we, we all know by well, uh, well by now that Facebook and Twitter are, are blocked in Iran. But at the same time, a substantial amount of the Google Earth, Chrome, uh, circumvention tools had quickly run up into encryption problems, export problems that led to a restriction in availability. And so as we see, uh, there were significant hurdles to actually any sort of uh, resource for political mobilization. This becomes, I think, very quickly the impetus for the conversation that we have now. Uh, and, and much of the policy the reactions that, were, were, uh, that stemmed from that. As Ian very correctly uh, identified, personal communications is one of those rare moments in American foreign policy where, for one, our democratic ambitions and our democratic values align with our national interests. If we take a look at the five sanctioned state, all of these are countries in which we have spent a great deal of resources investing in democratic capacity in civil society. And so, as a result of that, this notion that, uh, that information technology facilitates mobilization facilitates political socialization, it becomes very clear that an increase in this technology is therefore good for the social fabric of the state, as well as, quite fortunately, the foreign policy of the United States. Uh, it is also, incidentally, one of the uh, often one of the rare things in which uh, diaspora civil society, which have internal conflicts, can agree on. This is, this is something that is important for everyone's being. If you look, so, so we'll, I'll, I'll maybe get around to, uh, as a result, in 2010, after a substantial, uh, a substantial push by Iranian diaspora civil society, you had the codification of sort of a two-track approach. United States uh, um, sanctions policy uh, would, deem, uh, would, would identify particular technologies uh, that were deemed sensitive technologies. This comes out of the Comprehensive Iran Sanctions and Divestment Act. And then on the other side, you had this, this new classification uh, called personal communications technologies, incidental online uh, personal communications technologies. So, so what you had is this idea of restricting access to technologies that could be used by the state for repressive purposes, as the same, at the same time you start to promote a legal policy that makes available at least a limited subset uh, of, of technologies that could be used for communications and mobilization. Since then, you've had sort of a growth and expansion of, of both of these classifications. Uh, on the track of repressive technologies, you had uh, the, the gravity executive order, which allowed for not just sanctions inside of the country for human rights violations by technology, but also you had uh, the ability for now uh, extranational second, second party sanctions uh, of people outside of those particular countries that were pro providing these. You had the ability for the U.S. government to disbar uh, companies that were seen to facilitate uh, the Iranian and Syrian states in providing these technologies. But at the same time, in all of these cases, you had, you had the notion that personal communications technologies should be protected. Uh, right after every statement of repressive technology, you always had this line that personal communications over the internet should be a protected export. And so as a result, uh, you, you saw a very slow progression specifically after 2010, only in Iran, of the interpretive guidances and licensing policies that would make these uh, technologies more available. And so you had a 2012 interpretive guidance, a statement of licensing policy that would say that any license applications for personal communications would be deemed favorably, and then ultimately general license D. And I, I, th I think I'll end it at that. Um, yeah, I think I'll end it at that. Thanks. Uh, Brad? Thanks, uh, and thanks for inviting me today. Uh, I am the not, I'm the guy who's not the expert on internet freedom or technology, uh, exemplified by the fact that I needed to come here early today to, because I couldn't get my computer to work um, <laughs> and finish up some work uh, before the panel. Um, so I, I don't uh, bring the sort of internet expertise, internet freedom expertise, uh, or particularly Iran, but um, 
as Danielle mentioned, uh, two parts of my uh, background sort of bring me, uh, bring me to this panel and sort of make me interested in the topic. First, I served for a little over three years as an attorney uh, in the Office of the Chief Counsel for Foreign Assets Control, which is the group of lawyers that uh, advise OFAC. Um, and my portfolio at the time included Sudan, uh, Liberia, and a range of other um, primarily uh, sanctions programs related to various African countries and conflicts, uh, but I also worked a little bit on uh, terrorism in Burma and a few other uh, programs. And um, so can bring to the, to the discussion some of the considerations that the agency needs to keep in mind when, um, you know, I, I sat through a number of discussions in my time there where everybody around the table agrees uh, on what the right outcome would be, but it's very difficult to actually make it happen. Uh, and when you are trying to um, work in areas where you, uh, that are ubiquitous in general, as, as uh, Colin was just explaining, uh, but you want to sort of pick and choose at some level how, uh, how those technologies, how those services, how those transactions are going to be, uh, who they're going to be used by, when it's okay and when it's not okay, it makes the lawyers for the agency very nervous. Uh, the, the OFAC is generally uh, given a, a fairly high level of deference by courts, um, but it still operates under, it's still an administrative agency that operates under a standard where it can't take actions that are deemed to be arbitrary and capricious. It needs to take actions that are, um, that are generally consistent or can be consistent across uh, across its different uh, sanctions programs, even if the authorities differ, uh, and is always looking for consistency. And that's why the, the paper is, uh, provides an interesting discussion point, uh, because in times there are sanctions where you want things to be handled differently. Uh, OFAC wants the flexibility to be able to do things that address a particular national emergency at the same time uh, balancing that against the counterweight of how to ensure that sanctions are being administered fairly and reasonably and consistently across all of the agency's activities. Um, one other, uh, you know, of my experiences there that may come up uh, as we talk about the private sector, I worked on the Liberia sanctions. Uh, and while I was there, uh, the, the UN removed much of the sanctions that had applied to Liberia, particularly with respect to timber and diamonds. Um, <clears throat> and the remaining sanctions program was a quite limited list of people. Um, and you know, the hope was that the removal of those sanctions would certainly spur levels of investment in, in Liberia. And as the sanctions were removed uh, and time went on, that wasn't happening. And there was this question of what role should OFAC play in sort of telling people what the sanctions didn't cover, right, and telling people what was okay and sort of helping to move uh, investment into Liberia by saying, look, Liberia is no longer subject to, you know, the kinds of sanctions that were in place before. Um, and that prompts very, uh, I think, important discussions about what OFAC's role is versus perhaps the State Department's role or other agencies' roles in uh, not just administering sanctions, but sort of, but then helping to deal with uh, situations post-sanctions and, and helping to participate in whether it's reconstruction or investment or post-conflict investment, or in this case, um, you're talking about trying to get companies to do what OFAC is saying it's okay for them to do, but you know, there's always a line there that, that is dangerous for OFAC to walk in terms of advocating for companies to take steps that may, it, it may say are okay, but you know, it needs to, to preserve some level of neutrality about. Um, in my current uh, role, I work uh, extensively with companies trying to understand trade sanctions, which uh, you know, even having worked in OFAC is often difficult for me to do uh, even today. Uh, and companies, I think, face, you know, obviously the, the risk, the public reputation risk, the financial risk, OFAC's penalties are, can be substantial. Um, the risks that companies face in trying to evaluate when uh, it's okay to even get near to something that's uh, covered by sanctions, let alone something that might actually fall within the scope of a general license, uh, is, is a very often very high-level conversation at a company and requires a substantial expense for a company in terms of its own compliance programs, ensuring that it has the right things in place um, and has talked to the, to the right outside uh, experts. Um, and the last thing I'll say is um, my job in between those two was to work uh, at the State Department uh, on conflict diamonds and conflict minerals. Um, and 
in particular, the conflict minerals discussion uh, in the wake of legislation passed in 2010 um, as part of the Dodd-Frank financial reform bill. There was a provision that requires all companies uh, reporting on stock exchanges to report on certain levels of on due diligence they're undertaking with certain minerals. Um, it's a very complicated, complicated rule, a very expensive uh, undertaking and, and complicated process. And the conversation now in that space is how do we get companies to responsibly engage in Congo and Central Africa? We, we've set up this provision that requires them to understand what's in their supply chain. And we want them to take seriously not causing harm in Central Africa. But we don't want them to leave Central Africa. We want them to invest. And there's this very uh, difficult balance between companies sort of walling themselves off from a difficult situation. In this, in that, that situation would be sourcing minerals from outside of Africa entirely um, versus getting involved and getting engaged and perhaps taking on both reputational and perhaps even compliance risks. And I think the experience from that also I think weighs into this discussion of how companies evaluate when they should be involved in a difficult situation versus when they should pull back and, and leave it to someone else. So I'll stop there. Anwar, you're up. Yeah. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Anwar Dafalla. I'm a computer scientist um, and uh, educator. I'm interested in you know educating our kids in Sudan uh, having them trained and become ready for the knowledge economy for the 21st century. Um, I, I studied, I graduated from Egypt uh, and in 2002, I was wondering why we don't have Microsoft in Sudan until I realized that there is a U.S. sanctions. That's the first time for me to be aware of, you know, the, the U.S. sanctions. And uh, uh, some colleagues of mine couldn't get, you know, the, the Microsoft and Cisco certification because they were Sudanese. And um, uh, I was wondering about, you know, the notion of the sanctions and if, you know, the legislators uh, and the regulators uh, are aware of, you know, the, the impact of these sanctions on ordinary people, on citizens of Sudan and the sanctions country. So I would like to engage you in, in my story by just, you know, if you can raise off your mobile phone, if you have one. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Uh, you cannot do, you know, much with this phone in Sudan. You can just, you know, say hi, goodbye, and text message. Nothing else. And I bet if you have a mobile phone, then you have a credit card that you can make transactions online, where you can buy, you can sell, and whatever. We don't have that in Sudan. You know, it's, it's, it's really bad to the extent that you cannot download, you know, Google Chrome from Sudan, based on your location, uh, the geographical location. So it's, uh, I obtained my PhD from South Korea. And uh, when I came back to Sudan, I started you know, teaching at the universities. And it was so frustrating to me to teach the students in the class something that they cannot practice outside. They, they don't have access to you know, the, the most of you know, the, the free and open source software that's available to everybody else. Uh, and they are not legable to, to have a training courses and get certified. It's very important for the, you know, the IT and uh, computer science students to have this kind of, of certificate to pursue their career. Access to knowledge is, is a big issue in Sudan. Um, I started TEDx Khartoum uh, back in 2011, and we had organized a couple of events until we get the shutdown of the event by the government last May. So access to knowledge is something that our government, our repressive government, doesn't like. Um, people started to protest after you know, the, the cut of the subsidiary of the oil uh, and gas in, in Khartoum back in September. And we had uh, the internet shut down for the whole country. And that was, was, was not justified by anything else rather than you know, having people don't have access to voice, to send their voice outside. Um, so we have a kind of double pressure from a repressive, repressive government inside Sudan 
and limited access to knowledge and to education and to access from outside Sudan because of the UN sanctions. So I'm, I'm really happy to be part of this panel and thanks to the New America Foundation for this invitation. Uh, I'm really happy to be here and be part of the conversation. I'm so happy you know, that I'm representing a wide range of people who don't have access, who don't have a chance to, you know, to, 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 to express what's going on inside Sudan. So yeah, thank you. Great. Um, thank you all for those uh, very interesting introductions. Um, I'd like to start by talking uh, a little bit about Iran and actually about some of the, some of the things that um, I think Brad in his introduction mentioned, this idea that um, you, you have a, a concept or something where everybody sitting around the table agrees about the outcome, that, that something <clears throat> should be made available, that these tools might be important. But how do you get, the question is how you get there and how, what's the strategy for a policy? How do you create a policy that works? Um, and how do you actually you know, implement it and then get companies to implement it? Um, so with that in mind, I'd like to talk a little bit first about um, uh, Iran. And so as we talked about, as we mentioned uh, in May, the government issued General License D, uh, and that makes it legal for the first time for, uh, since the sanctions have been in place for American companies to export not only software and services that are uh, free and publicly available, but also hardware um, and uh, products that, that you actually have to pay for. So this is everything from free antivirus software to cell phones and laptops. Um, the question is, uh, you know, this is one of a series of steps that's been taken since 2009. So how did we, how did we get to this point? Um, and uh, how, what was the sort of gradual evolution? And, and I'm hoping that um, Colin can talk a little bit about uh, sort of setting the stage in some of the context. He mentioned some of it in his introduction. Uh, and maybe uh, if Ian can jump in uh, as well, uh, with some of the, the foreign policy perspective here and kind of the, the question of promoting internet freedom and promoting these policies, um, how you actually, what you what it actually looks like in practice and how we went from, uh, you know, the, the early, uh, auth the first authorization and the, the statements of uh, licensing policy and guidance to general license D. Well, I think, I think we covered some of the progression in, in the opening statements. So rather to focus on one specific thing, the reality is of most of these states is that control of information is fundamental to political repression. If you look at the statements and the requests made by a, a very large portion of the civil society groups, the substantial thing is, is we need more than anything access to these platforms. If you, so let's start to take uh, a piecemeal approach to looking at how states control these networks. And I think the most substantial and meaningful one that still applies today is you have end user, end host uh, computer security. If you're in Iran, you, for one, cannot buy a legitimate copy of your operating system. So you are most likely buying something or using something that you bought uh, for a dollar called the King's Pack that has the Photoshop and, and, and Microsoft Windows and Microsoft Word. And to, you know, it's, it's the 2013 you know, version. It might even be called the 2015 version when you bought it. But it is incredibly dubiously sourced it will more often than not, not receive updates. And so structurally, from the beginning, your end host is compromisable. So based off of that, for one, like I said, you can't update your software because you've pirated your software. But let's say you uh, maintain a legitimate version. Because you're in that country, when your update service goes to try to connect to the end vendor, the end vendor will block you. So all of a sudden, your Adobe Reader is a three-year-old version that happened to be the version that was out when the, the CD that you bought was uh, installed and is now vulnerable to a, a, a significant number of very easy to obtain exploits. So based off of that, you have a, a vulnerable operating system with vulnerable software. What is the state going to do? What is a politically repressive state going to do? They are going to malware everyone in civil society because it has no cost. Malware towards one person is the same cost as malware towards everyone you have their email address. And so in every one of these states, you've had specific 
targeted and broad sweeping campaigns to violate the information security of people inside of the country and outside of the country. You have the cyber jihadists in Sudan, you have uh, the Iranian cyber army, you have the uh, uh, Syrian electronic army. These are state-sponsored actors that are using the disconnect between uh, s technological security and the user as a way to start to round up political dissidents. And so if you look, the requests of the, these, the civil society in these companies is, er, countries is more often than not, not specific technologies that are advanced, not access to you know, satellite internet, rarely uh, that. Um, but just the fundamental equality on the internet that everyone else appreciates. And so I, I think that if you just take those one, that one thing, that one aspect, that's what's generalizable. And those are specific and direct causal relationships. On top of that, you have a significant number of ancillary second party dependencies. The internet is not one vendor, one person. Everyone is dependent on, on structural platforms, structural mechanisms. And so, for example, uh, GoDaddy and, and Google App Engine are amongst the most, uh, most popularly used web services companies. They block access to everyone originating from a sanctioned state. Most of their customers don't know this, and so you have uh, things like high-profile, academic, critical sources of information about what's going on in these countries that are blocked not because of the, the governments that oppose them, but actually because of their companies, the companies they hosted with. Just a random choice. But they don't know this. And, and this <coughs> is the, the, the importance of this cannot be understated because you have things like the Khan Academy, which is, is blocked significant educational platforms that are not only important to access to knowledge, but in some cases in which states uh, significantly repress uh, access to educational systems based off of religious, sexual, or ethnic minority status, it is the only access to, to, to knowledge. These are the tools in which civil society, democratization, religious groups need vitally and, more, and, and it's a lot less sophisticated from of satellite. The problem for, for a lot of these groups is, is the difference between OFAC and state and commerce is, is an abstraction. All they see is, is that the United States, they, they don't even understand the difference between a company, a corporate decision, which is often more conservative than the letter of the law. They don't understand the difference between that cor corporate decision and, and the decision of the United States. And so not only is this a strategic problem in our, in our significantly uh, uh, expansive and progressive internet freedom funding efforts, but it's also a public diplomacy problem. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, and I think, look, problem. I mean, and getting back to, so all this is, not a mystery. I mean, I think that uh, Colin can speak to this with a level of, of knowledge and familiarity that few people have anywhere, even within the, the, the among the people who are trying to solve uh, these problems. But I mean, I think, you know, Danielle, getting to your question of the the question is, why did we get what we got? Why didn't we get more? Why Iran first? And what can we do to to take advantage of what has already happened to sort of wedge the door open a little bit further. And, and on that, I, I mean, I, I think Collins, in going back to your first comments, I think, uh, uh, and uh, Brad said this as well, there is a general agreement that, w that uh, a uh, free flow of information in these societies is in our benefit, not just because we believe in uh, freedom of, of expression, uh, association, and assembly online, but also that a safer internet, a, a safe, an internet where information can flow, is in the interests of democratic reformers uh, and the, t the groups that we want to be supporting within repressive countries. Um, so that there's there's agreement on why we got it in Iran and not in other places, or why there seems to have been at least recently more push in Iran than in other places, is really in some ways a combination of more mundane bureaucratic ac um, functions rather than any sort of substantive uh, difference. So, you know, it was a combination of having 
a very well-staffed uh, program. There are a lot of people who work on Iran, so there are a number of smart, talented, bright people who are working on that program. A, a real push to change the status quo and, and a desire to see the status quo being changed, and that push being uh, really kind of uh, crystallized around events like president making a speech on the ruse or elections coming up and a desire to see what can we do uh, and th that sort of bureaucratic uh, tree shaking in advance of those events to see you know what can be done and a situation that is kind of intractable that it's hard there's a lot of resources trying to make things better but not a lot of options available to those bureaucrats who are uh, the, the people who are working within government to do that and so this sort of rises to the top in a way that it might not in another country where for Syria, in Syria, for instance, where there are a lot of other things that the people who, the limited number of people who are working in that country are focusing their attention on, uh, or you know, other countries where there might not be the same level of staff resources to really think about it. And, and so when you go through the process, so that is one side of it, and then you know, in going through the process of trying to wrangle all of the parts of government that need to be involved in changing sanctions and export control policy, I mean, there are a lot of mo moving parts for one country uh, there certainly was an interest in seeing some of the the, the uh, policies that we were crafting be more general and apply to more places uh, than Iran, but there was also the the strategic interest in getting it through quickly and involving a lot of other countries in the discussion explicitly would have slowed down the frankly would have slowed down the process on a number of these things and we thought it was I think there were decisions that were made that you know this is important f for this moment in this country let's get that out now and then we can follow up later on, on um, uh, that that is a foothold around which we can broaden at a later point and so it, I think you know, the well absolutely um, the the problems are real and need to be addressed and and it is yeah, it, it, I think there, there is a recognition of that. It's a matter of how do we, you know, take advantage of working the levers in the right way to make it happen. But it, it, just, it for oh, one second, no, go ahead. Ahead. No, no, uh, it, I mean, just a couple quick, I guess, um, thoughts from the, you know, sort of looking at this as a, almost as a spectator uh, in terms of, of, of why we got where we got. I mean, I, I think just a couple of things to keep in mind. I mean, technology is probably, you know, the the hardest thing for for an agency to regulate because of the way it moves and because of its its quick evolution, um, you know, OFAC, especially at the licensing and policy level. I mean, you're, they're generalists, right? They're people who are dealing with. If you're an Iran licensing officer, you're handling this and you're handling food and you're handling you know people bring you know dealing with their personal uh, personal transactions, a whole range of things on a daily basis. Other export control agencies have, uh, some of them anyway, have sort of technical experts on particular, you know, kinds of munitions or kinds of products. If, if, OVAC, has, if OVAC has any industry expertise, it's the financial sector because banks are really at the, the forefront of implementing OFAC sanctions. So if there is any real industry expertise, it's financial. It's not, I mean, I didn't even understand half of what Colin said in, you know, uh, <laughs> in terms of how the, the Internet uh, effects work. For an agency to do that and then um, and then and then regulate it is very challenging and and I think you know when you look at what OFAC did over those course of years, it's it's exactly about ensuring that they're not going too far, too soon uh, that they understand what they're doing and sort of taking a let everything that's free go out first, see how that works, take a licensing policy, encourage uh, you know it's not that exports. Um, uh, you know, encouraging people to come in for licensing and allowing it on a specific basis and then rolling it out on a general basis, that's a, that's a sort of careful bureaucratic and maybe frustrating from the outside, but from, uh, from the inside, an approach that ensures that they're, they can understand what it is they're doing in the first place, and then as they're doing it, make sure that it's handled properly. I mean, in fact, you know, it evolves slowly. The definition for information and informational material still includes microfiche and, and microfilm. And without, you know, with no offense to librarians, there aren't a lot of people that are looking <laughs> at that. And I, I think it's hard for information to be really wrestled with in a way that can be done properly. And I think Ian's point in terms of, you know, the bureaucratic muscle directed at, at Iran is is certainly undeniable. I mean, when I was working on Sudan in, in 2006, seven the height of the Darfur activism era and plan, the rollout of Plan B by the Bush administration. I mean, we often sort of said to ourselves, 
it's difficult to get attention against Iran and against terrorism and against other really important sanctions programs. And if anything, over the last several years, the focus on Iran has only uh, increased. So uh, I think it is, um, it's not surprising at all that Iran would be the first place this would roll out in. And I think in terms of, of people understanding in, internally what, what Anwar referenced in terms of the situation in Sudan, it, it's, it's difficult to get the right level of attention and the right level of understanding to figure out how these policies can, can translate across. So. Um, great. Uh, so I think one of the um, really, I think one of the keys that both Brad and, um, and Ian have brought up is the, the challenge of the technical definitions, the, the actual language itself. Um, and so uh, one of the things, you know, talking a little bit specifically about uh, general license, the general license D, um, I'd be curious for, for, um, for you guys to give some thoughts about uh, kind of what goes into coming up with those definitions and, and some of the advocacy, some of the conversations that you have to have to figure out um, what's the policy that you're, that you're striving for and, and how you can cra craft something that is both, you know, that, that sort of meets all of these goals. And as we lay them out, they, it sounds very ambitious. It has to be something that you can get through the bureaucratic process. It has to be something that uh, is accurate and to the point in a way that companies feel that they that they can, um, that their products actually meet those definitions and that therefore they're covered um, from a legal perspective. And it also has to be something that is, is flexible so that it doesn't change, so that we're not, you know, talking about microfiche. Um, uh, and, and, you know, obviously if a technology is obsolete, that maybe is one thing or, again, no offense to librarians, but um, also if, if, as things change. So I would, would love to hear a little bit more about um, uh, the, the, the particular question of actually crafting that language, so the, that first general license, but actually more specifically general license D. Yeah, I guess one thing, you know, being a lot being embedded in the belly of the beast of the bureaucratic process gave me both an incredible amount of frustration with the bureaucratic process and also a level of appreciation that I would never have had otherwise. If I had been given the, 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 the power to just write the policy and I could write it on my own, I'm sure it would have been awful, right? I think that the, there, there is a bureaucratic process for a reason, that there are a lot of different interests that are involved and people who have very specific pieces of information about what are some of the unintended consequences of some of the things that I might be interested in pursuing within, or, or might be central to what the policy goals are that I'm uh, defending. You know, how is this going to affect other, other interests and other people uh, who are involved in this as well? And part of that bureaucratic process is, is, is getting to well, what is the right definition. There might be things that, that are really important from a human rights and democracy st standpoint, but have really you know, bad unintended consequences from a you know, actually supporting people that we wouldn't want to be supporting, or from a, um, you know, a security standpoint in some other way. And so th that is why that, that process exists. And, and while it can be very frustrating at times, I mean, I think that, that it certainly adds, adds benefit. Um, it's one of the things, part of, part of this that I want to unpack, this is something that, that Brad made a reference to is that it's even when everybody agrees that there should be some there are technologies that are not available today or not explicitly permissible today that we want to permit there are a number of vehicles that are available to do that and choosing the right vehicle really matters and so and I, I, I only got a, a s opportunity to skim the paper but I know that the paper talks a bit about exemptions versus um, licensing in general terms. Um, I don't know if it also gets into the question of you know, do you issue a general license or do you in, in issue a statement of favorable licensing policy, which is another decision. Uh, there might be t uh, tools that you want to be available in a country, but you also want, there are a number of reasons why you might still want to have some sort of licensing process. For instance, you just want to know what is going in. You would, it would be useful information to know if a lot of really bad and secure technology was going into Iran, or it would be useful information to know you know, who, who within the country has the ability, to, we, we want cell phone networks to exist and to be maintained, but it would be really useful to know who has the ability to set up and maintain a use, uh, cell phone network within the country and who does not. And so there are th these decisions that need to be made about the, the consequences of requiring a more burdensome process of companies uh, versus the, the consequences of, uh, or the, versus the benefits of, 
uh, of having uh, a, di a different set of uh, having more information or different uh, other reasons why you might have a different set of of tactics uh, apart from so that's 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 sort of the first set of questions and then what falls under it is a constantly moving list as well where different people with different sets of technical knowledge or industry knowledge or uh, knowledge about uh, the uh, how these tools are being used or how they could potentially be used are all part of that discussion of well how do we and and people who have an expertise in being able to define it in a way that companies are companies lawyers or the, the specialized lawyers that they bring in to talk to their lawyers can figure out whether, whether this applies to the tools that they're developing uh, already so I mean I don't know if that gets at what you were looking for, I mean, the answer you were looking for, but. <laughs> it certainly does to an extent. I, I'd love to give Brad a moment, and then I will get back to Colin, I think, if, if he's interested. But Brad, a moment to talk a little bit about the that difference between the authorization and the yeah. uh, exemption, and then um, and some of the kind of the actual nuances of the licensing that sure. impact the policies that we see. Sure. Uh, so um, <clears throat> these terms are often kind of bandied about at the same time, because at some level they have the same result, which me, which is, um, if you are a company, you can do whatever it is you want to do without needing to go to OFAC and get a piece of paper that says it's okay for you to do that. But the differences are important. There is a there's something called the Berman Amendment, which was uh, which was enacted uh, thanks to Congressman Berman, uh, that exempts and sort of carves out from sanctions authorities the ability to regulate information and inf or informational materials. So it uh, and it also carves out, for example, travel. It's sort of a directed at First Amendment type protections uh, for all, essentially, and that applies to all sanctions programs at this stage except for Cuba. Um, and so the travel part doesn't apply to Cuba, the information does. Uh, but essentially it means that OFAC can't regulate. So you're sort of, it's territory where no, where there can't be any um, penalties, there's no licensing. OFAC doesn't have the authority to tell you it's okay to send a book to Cuba or to Iran because it doesn't have jurisdiction over that, that transaction. Um, that can be, at some level, it can sound liberating that OFAC doesn't have authority, but it, it's, from a company compliance perspective, often difficult because you don't have anything saying it's okay. You have only the interpretations and the sort of compliance program you can develop that you are internally comforting yourself that that transaction you're undertaking is okay, and you're hoping that if you ever got asked by OFAC that why did you do that, you can demonstrate, hey, that was exempt. You don't have authority there, but that can be a difficult uh, process. A general license or an authorization or a specific, you know, a general license is something like general license D, which OFAC issues and applies to every U.S. person. Um, a specific license is obviously one where you write in and they send you a license that says you can do what it, what it is you asked for. Um, a general license is means that OFAC has jurisdiction, which means if you say you're using general license D, but you don't fall within the terms of it, OFAC can come back and say you and, and potentially uh, pursue you for penalties because you're using that license improperly. Just like if you had gotten a, it's as if every person in, you know opened up their mail one day and had a license from OFAC that said you can send informational material, you can send, uh, you can undertake transactions to allow you to engage in you know fee-based Skype with Iran. Um, but if you do it wrong, then potentially you're you're facing violations. So um, again, it's. Uh, in some ways, it's better for a company to have that general license because there's at least something telling them what's in and what's out. Um, but again, you're still needing to maintain a compliance program that um, should something ask, should a bank stop a financial transaction, you can then demonstrate, hey, this is covered by the general license. Um, a specific license you know, that sort of follows licensing policy is you're going to write to OFAC and you're going to essentially wait for OFAC to decide whether or not your application fits within that scope of licensing or not, and you're likely to get a fair number of restrictions uh, or conditions on how you use that license. All, all of these things, as, it's, as, as you can understand, are difficult from an, from an agency perspective. I mean, many of the things Ian just described, and, and again, the things that, the kinds of issues Colin got at, you know, to, to, to develop definitions and develop terms of the sort of what it is we're trying to, what are we trying to regulate, and what are we trying to allow at a kind of conceptual level, and then who are we trying to regulate it against, right? I mean, uh, export controls that might be administered by the Commerce Department and the State Department are 
maybe primarily directed at the what you want. You're, you're concerned about what it is that's being exported and kind of what risk that represents to the U.S. government to allow it to go to a foreign person. Sanctions are all about the who. They're all about sort of who the person is at the other end and marrying up the kind of what it is we want to regulate with the who it is we want to allow to engage in a certain transaction or, or prohibit from a certain transaction, you know, that's a narrow strip on a Venn diagram. Uh, and it can be a difficult one to, to craft in any way that, um, that has that, as, as you mentioned, Daniel, you want that to be flexible. If it's going to take a year to figure it out, you want it to have shelf life of more than a week before, um, before either the what or the who change. I mean, if you think of a situation like Syria, um, and I'm not a Syria expert, but just understanding what I read in the news, um, if you had tried to craft a sort of who it is we're trying to, to allow to engage in certain activities in, say, 2011, in terms of the opposition and, and, the, and, and the effort to overthrow, uh, to, to protest the Assad regime, that's probably a very different who than exists in 2013. And figuring out how to maintain that in a way that, again, ensures that OFAC is 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 uh, carrying out its activities consistently and reasonably, and in a way that isn't arbitrary, is a, is a, is a tough balance to uh, to get to. So I, I think that uh, my role in this is to play the the foil to to Treasury and State to a certain extent. So out of that, I want to really respect the uh, respect the position of Treasury by sort of giving a little context because. I understand, I understand that Treasury is basically a, a, an organization with a fixed set of resources against an expanding set of responsibilities. Treasury is responsible for some of the most broad sweeping uh, uh, economic sanctions programs in the history of the United States. It is responsible for constructing a program which denies any sort of commerce. And so as civil society, we are asking them to punch very narrow holes in a very, very strict sanctions regime. That's incredibly difficult. I, and, and especially against you know, increasing mandates due to congressional sanctions, pressure that if you, go, if you, if you mess up, you're going to get dragged out to the hill. Uh, probably, I imagine, that uh, uh, essentially Treasury is in a position of, of determining what the joint plan of action is for the, uh, the Iran nuclear agreement. And so all of these requests that I'm making I understand, and we, we need to understand and respect the fact that those are occurring at the same time. However, a lot of these requests are not, are not taxes or, or requests for resources. They're, they're iterative processes in, in prioritizations. Everything that, every sort of licensing process, every form of clearance is a tax on companies which want to do good in countries where they can't necessarily even make a profit. And so the more that we touch things and we want to evaluate things and we want to hold things up just to make sure, the more that it creates delays. Even under a specific and favorable license, uh, license regime, you see delays on applications that go from anywhere from five months to a year. This is under favorable technology and often under the most non-controversial, highly demanded uh, uh, services. And so now this is, mind you, uh, I assume that the majority of resources are not going in Treasury to licensing, but probably enforcement. And I think that we need to respect that, and I think that actually uh, more than civil society, Congress needs to respect that. And maybe just as much as we're talking about uh, Treasury doing the right thing to civil society and the publics of these countries, we should be talking about how Congress needs to do the right thing for Treasury, but also bind their hand a little bit and make them uh, uh, have faster clearance times. Uh, however, taking a piecemeal approach taxes everyone, including Treasury. And so having incongruent, uh, incongruent sets of laws between countries means that all of a sudden you've increased substantially compliance because you either have to deal with all sanctioned countries alike in which you're enforcing the lowest bar of regulation, or you have to uh, evaluate every single licensing regime and imagine at the rate in which uh, 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 your average export compliance lawyer charges uh, how costly that is. Um, lastly, uh, what I want to say is, is that in part this is solved by having an iterative 
process that has more public attention. Because as civil society, what we get is essentially a licensing policy uh, or a general license that drops out of nowhere. And as best as we can do is we can throw as much information as possible uh, in order to, to hopefully have some of it get in. If, if, if there is a need for technical exp expertise, if there's a need for understanding the situational environment, this is exactly why civil society exists. But instead, you've had an opaque process for the most part in which, in which there hasn't been external deliberation, there hasn't been ex external input. And so if these resources exist in the world, we just have to have a, a more transparent, deliberative process in order to get to that place. Civil society, Iranian civil society, is just as con concerned as the wrong, about the wrong technology getting into Iran as they are the right technology. We're all on the same page in this regard. And towards that, we have to have a discussion about it. Yeah, I guess I was going to push back a little bit on the process being ent entirely opaque. I mean, I do think that it maybe has been selective, and, and, and certainly I know that that on the state side, side of state, that there was a lot of consultation in, with individually with groups that might have information about what would be, what kind of. Uh, technologies were being denied and what would be important when the the uh, statement of licensing policy and um, interpretive guidance were rolled out there was a big meeting there were a number of open meetings with, with civil members of civil society and companies there were closed meetings uh, uh, and individual meetings there are probably five or six members of the State Department who are in this audience right now and are participating in uh, in uh, these sorts of meetings uh, so I, I, I think in some ways, I mean, my view was that at the time that a lot, with, with very rare exceptions, with a few exceptional people, there were very few people within civil society that were really prepared to talk about this in a way with this sort of depth that was necessary to really be helpful at the time. So while it wasn't a, an open process, I mean, honestly, there, there, there was even a, there, the, I mean, there were documents that, um, that had a, a comment period. It, it, that was involved as well, and there were some there was some feedback to that as well. Uh, but but I you know so I think you know could it have been more open? Probably it could have. Um, but I but I do think that it was uh, as open as many policies tend policy making tends to be when you when you're working within a crunch time window. I mean I, I can see the frustration from the outside that you just never you know you hear about this a year in advance, and then it seems like there's no movement, no movement, no movement, and all of a sudden something drops. I mean that's just sort of the the frustrations of of how the ebbs of flows of, of these sorts of things go. But I, I think that more organization on our side, which is, again, a good reason to, for us to be having a paper like this, meetings like this, will put us in a better position to, uh, to be able to proactively influence those policies as, as the opportunities come up. Thank you, guys. I want to sort of segue a little bit and continue this conversation, but but talk a little bit specifically also not just about what ha has happened for Iran, but uh, about Sudan. Um, and, you know, we've been talking about this from a, a foreign policy perspective. Um, and one of the things that, that Ian mentioned and, and that uh, we observed is that, you know, sometimes one, one factor that can influence um, uh, policy change is also what's happening on the ground. And so um, I'd love, I'd like, and Anwar talked a little bit about this in his opening remarks about what's going on in Sudan right now and the impact of sanctions. Um, I'd like if you could unpack that a little bit more in terms of talking about uh, the nonviolent protest movement, the role of, you know, these kinds of tools and sort of the, the negative impact of sanctions. And we can talk then a little bit about um, what what a, what a good policy solution for Sudan might look like, what some of the challenges are, um, and how that might work. So if you could yeah. sort of start us off. Yeah, um, I guess that the available com uh, communication tools for uh, the Sudanese activists online are a little bit, um, a few. And when, when, you, when, you, when you keep exploring the, the, the available tools, for the digital activists, you will find that the government, cyber jihadist, and the security uh, agency has already, you know, um, intervened for you know the, their their communication, the secure communication, the secure communication channels for for uh, for the activists. 
and we had you know a couple of activists were detained and tortured and forced to open their Facebook account, their social social media account. So uh, the tools are no more uh, secure by any means, and that's that's a, a troublesome for for you know the the whole Sudanese protesters or the Sudanese oppositions against the the, the government. Uh, I think you know that the. The, the lack of training, the proper training also for, for the Sudanese youth uh, inside the universities, inside the, the public arena, is also another factor to be added to the fact that, you know, that communication inside Sudan is not, is not secured for, for people, people losing their life because of their digital activism. Uh, we have many security um, officers inside the telecom companies, the four major companies in Sudan where they can uh, they can observe and censor all the, the digital transactions on daily basis so so in uh, in a nutshell I guess our our role as as a digital activist for you know people who are pro the government uh, pro pro democracy and against you know the terror act uh, acts of the government, uh, we are in a weak position right now in Sudan, and that has been happening for the past 14 years, since 1979, uh, yeah, 97, sorry. Yeah, and I guess uh, if we could have, like, general license D, like, you know, at the, the, what the Iranians get, uh, that will make stuff much better than, than what's going on. Uh, during the, the last protest in, uh, in Khartoum, uh, the internet shut down for the whole country. And then we have a slow internet. And then we have uh, a catch for many digital activists. Up to now, people are you know, subject to, to you know, trials, going to court every day. And then we have a media blackout. We have the you know, shutdown of many newspapers. Uh, in the uh, independent newspapers in Sudan. So uh, I guess that the, the impact of the, the sanctions um, is, uh, is huge in this, in this aspect because young people are using the social media to communicate and to, to mobilize uh, each other. So, um, the sorry. One of the un unintended consequences of the of the, the, the sanctions is that the, the software piracy now became a culture in Sudan. So no 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 uh, the software piracy is um, is huge. Uh, no one is expected to pay a penny for a software even if it was made by Sudanese. So uh, I guess that as the time goes we'll have We'll have a you know a new entire new generation of young Sudanese who are not expected to be connected, integrated to the world, uh, to the the knowledge economy, uh, as as it uh, as it was supposed to be. Also, we have a very high rise of you know viruses circulating inside the networks of Sudan. Um, I was uh, looking at a report by the F Secure Lab in uh, Finland. And I see Sudan is one of the, the most active areas in viruses. Uh, we are not source of viruses, but we are, you know, a big channel, a very active area of, of viruses. So I, I hope we to, will get the generalized D and we collaborate with the, you know, the people here uh, in explaining and uh, collaborating in, in putting maybe appropriate targeted sanctions against, against the government, not against the people in Sudan. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Um, I think we, we don't have a ton of time left, but so I, I sort of, I think to the point um, directly, the question uh, that you guys might be able to shed a little light on is, is what does that take? How possible, it, how, how likely is it that we can, or, or what would have to happen mm -hmm. in order to see a policy change um, for Sudan, even, you know, if it's relying on the template of general license D and kind of moving that through government? 
um, uh, without without sort of being inside the the Sudan policy discussions, I, I think you know a lot of what um, you know what Ian and Colin described before in terms of what it took to get you know General License D uh, and and its predecessors that sort of the evolution towards General License D in Sudan. Um, I mean, I think first there has to be agreement that this is the right. Um, that this is the right approach. That this is the right. That this is needed for uh, for the people of Sudan, for the for those who are uh, protesting the Bashir regime, and and sort of balancing how it, you know, what the appearances are, and what else is happening in terms of the overall negotiations that are going on. Again, I mean, the the complexity of Sudan and the issues related to Sudan in terms of both its relationship with the south and the border areas between north and south. Uh, as well as Darfur and, and other and the east, uh, and there are so many complexities to the the Sudanese issue. It's sort of uh, I, I think it would just take a, a fair amount of explaining about how moving a general license or a statement of licensing policy through would still send the right signals to the Sudanese government, would send the right pe- signals to the Sudanese people, and 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 then again balancing. Um, opening up these technologies to the Sudanese people without at the same time further empowering the Sudanese government can be a, a, a difficult balance t- to make. And, and you know, I, I don't know the, the details of sort of the, the potential market or the potential risks that companies would face. But again, e- even if you were to get the, the government, uh, the U.S. government to sort of issue these, these um, I mean, the, the original general license in 2010 it did apply to Sudan. It's sort of the statement of licensing policy and general license D for fee-based products that, that doesn't extend yet to Sudan. Um, getting companies to extend their efforts in that direction may, may be as difficult based on what the potential market is as well as what the potential risks are for a government that has been, you know, involved in genocide and... Uh, and um, and, and a range of, of terrorist and other related activities to, to get the to get companies to to say that it's the right decision for them to to even take advantage of the general license based on what the risks are. Um, again, ensuring that they comply with the general license and then what the public reputation risks are, um, I think, would be a significant challenge. I think it's because of the significant amount of attention Iran has had, both bureaucratically but also in the public discourse. I think companies are. Are, are likely more aware of the situation in and the risks involved in Iran than they would be of, of Sudan. I'm, I'm making an assumption there. I don't know that to be the case, but my, my, my sense would be that companies would face a lot more internal discussion about whether it's taking advantage of a general license in the Sudan uh, program would be, would be appropriate. So I, I think it's, uh, it's a lot of education and a lot of outreach along the lines that, that Colin mm-hmm. mentioned in terms of the role of civil society and the role of, uh, of activists on this here and in, in Khartoum. All right. All right. Fair enough. Um, yeah, just briefly, I mean, I do think that, that having general license D out there for Iran does clear a lot of brush in some ways. It, 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 it answers a number of questions. Uh, some of those would need to be relooked at. Uh, you, you would, you know, state and treasury and, and others would want to look at those within the context of Sudan, but having that as a template I think is useful. Uh, uh, two suggestions. One would be certainly, as, as Brad mentioned, treasury and OFAC feel a lot of pressure to be consistent, and so appealing on the grounds of consistency that the principled arguments that were made around making these technologies available in uh, Iran also apply in Sudan. and, and Answering some of those questions about uh, how what this looks like on the ground, what is available, what isn't, but but appealing to that that desire to be consistent, I think, is uh, will be important as you try to lateral these uh, general license D into other countries. And then the second thing I would say is really engaging the uh, the Sudan policy community, the diaspora community, others who are engaged in the topic. If, if people who are working on Sudan don't hear this coming from the people that they talk to every day about Sudan, if they don't, if these people aren't telling them that it's an important issue, then they're, they're less likely to take it seriously. Uh, so I think some education even within the, the Sudan interest community, the, the civil society community specifically interested in Sudan policy, would be uh, important for getting the sort of traction that you're going to need to make a move. <clears throat> so I'll give a simple philosophy and a simple rule, and, uh, and then respect that the world is a little more nuanced than that. 
The simple philosophy is, is that personal communications is based off of the entirety of U.S. law, one of the areas in which uh, de our democratic values align with our fo foreign policy interests. Berman, from the outset, sets this as one of the elements of, of U.S. sanctioned policies, is access to information, information materials, is something that should not be regulated. And so if we are going to start to take ex uh, foreign policy considerations vis-a-vis -vis our relationships with, with foreign governments into account, it has to be a high bar for us to negotiate away those values. Secondly, a simple sort of rule or, or a litmus test, which is repressive governments have pretty good access to anything that they want based off of the money, the resources, and the international connections that they have. Sudan, ha the, the ruling elite of Sudan and Syria, by all indications, have access to anything that they want because they either have the money or ha they have the relationships with uh, uh, telecommunications companies uh, that aren't particularly care, uh, uh, careful about human rights policies. Um, I think that our imaginations can uh, sort of fill in the gaps of who that is, Huawei. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even call. Finally, oh yeah, <laughs> ZTE. Uh, civil society understands its role in this, and this is fundamental to the reason why we're here. We understand that there are two barriers here. A lot of them are not U.S. policy. They're the, the decisions that are made in, in council, in companies, that, that we will never speak to uh, and have actually personally sometimes a very good reason for why they make the decisions that they do. However, U.S. policy is also a very good mechanism for, uh, uh, for civil society to drive home the point that this is important, this is legal, and there are people out there to help you. And so this is, a, this is an area in which the United States has the ability to set the tone and to enable civil society to do a, a, a substantial amount of work that it is willing, ready, and able to do. Great. Um, so we've got a few minutes left, and I want to give the audience, if anyone has any questions, a chance to ask them. Um, so if anyone uh, has anything else they want to add, if not, we can open it up. That's work for you all. I think I saw a hand in the back there. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Mr. Anderson. Um, how much have you seen the state back hackers use vulnerabilities in uh, old and outdated software to target dissidents? And do you see this uh, extending to like external actors, um, other countries, et cetera? Is that an NSA reference, the latter portion of it? <laughs> um, we, we see it in, uh, an incredibly substantial portion of the time. Uh, we see cases in which during the election in Iran, uh, the, the Iranian cyber army was using vulnerabilities and outdated versions of readers in, or in, order, to, in order to gain access to uh, foreign-based journalists' computers. They were sending uh, files that would uh, purport to be statements of reformist figures, and those would allow full access. And on top of that, this was effective. We could see, based off of some of the back-end reporting that we were able to gain access to for these, these, uh, these efforts, that there were times at this critical moment in electoral politics that, that, um, that these malicious entities, these, these state-backed actors, were, were compromising one person every hour. And if you think about the role of, of these sort of in information leakages, it's not just compromising one person, it's compromising entire networks. You're only as strong as your weakest link. And so not only do we see significant, recurrent, and uh, broadly generalizable cases across all of these countries, we also see that they are effective. And, and on top of that, uh, it's clear that they're also growing. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure I totally understand the external portion of the question. Uh, I was just was referring to uh, them using it not necessarily against dissidents, but against other countries as part of their uh, state cyber war capabilities. I, I mean, everyone's trying to hack everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, states, anonymous. Do you have another question? 
Yes, hi, um, um, Rob Lieber from AFP. You, you touched on this a little bit at the end uh, uh, about repressive governments having access to whatever they want, but um, one of the things we, we heard in, in recent years when we talk about technology and sanctions is that you know we're, we're trying to stop repressive governments from gaining access to a certain sophisticated technology. And even though you seem to be saying you're in agreement on a lot of things, I sense maybe there's a little bit of disagreement here. And are, are you trying to say that you want to just forget about sanctions uh, altogether in, in this sector, or are you going to try to fine tune them in, in a way that seems pretty daunting given the, given the technical savvy of the regulators? Um, I think just briefly to address that, um, uh, it's the, the idea here is not um, like a removal of technology sanctions in general, but, but a targeted approach. And so um, I, I Colin mentioned this at the beginning um, in his remarks when he talked about this sort of parallel track approach uh, towards Iran sanctions, which was um, focusing on, on availability for personal communications tools, for the things that enable uh, you know, ordinary individuals and the population to communicate and access information, but also actually a focus on clearly defining the sensitive technologies, the, the censorship and surveillance equipment, malware, those, um, those things that, that when they get in the hands of oppressive governments are, are even more dangerous, um, and actually, uh, you know, identifying how to enforce rules against those and, and the clear penalties. And so in a, you know, the parallel side of the, the carve-outs for personal communications tools in um, our sanctions policy has been uh, like the gravity executive order, which applies to Iran and Syria, um, uh, which talks about th those very, the technologies you can use to perpetuate human rights abuses and not allowing American made technology to end up to be that technology. So for like the blue coats, the, uh, the you know, uh, the California based company that, that provides surveillance equipment, um, not having that end up in the hands of sanctioned governments. That doesn't mean that they may not be getting that te technology elsewhere if they're not getting it from American companies. Uh, and that's, a, you know, I think a whole other issue. But um, uh, it's not, it, it's the idea, or, you know, at least from our perspective, is that um, you have to see both sides of the issue. And so while you're talking about carve outs on one, on one, on the one hand, you're not, we're not talking about, you know, um, a general removal of these, uh, of these sanctions. It's terminology. I mean, one of the things, one of the, uh, the predecessors to this project was actually that under, under two of the sanctions bills, there were mandates for uh, the regulation of what was deemed sensitive technologies in a human rights context. Uh, the same set of groups that are promoting exactly this issue of access to information also participated in a, a substantial uh, re uh, response to a request for comment on defining what that uh, what sensitive technologies are. Uh, the, this is this is something in which both uh, both sides are being dealt with. Uh, what we're defining in terms of exemptions to sanctions are personal communications devices. They're cell phones, they're laptops. They're not higher-end technology that are capable of substantially increasing the repressive capacity of the state. And so, in fact, I think that, I think that we understand on top of that a mature policy towards export licensing compliance has to understand regulating specific forms of technology, specific forms of UK use cases and end destinations at the same time as we have to have uh, broad authorizations or uh, exemptions for technologies that, that have so, you know, such a, a marginal chance of being used for illegitimate purposes. Yeah, I mean, it, I hate to like have my final comment be a it's complicated compliment or comment, but it, I mean it is complicated. Uh, and there, well, there are a set of technologies that, as Colin says, that are easily defined as, oh, you know, antivirus software being available is better for the for for our interests than you know, even if the bad guys have it, it's better that antivirus software be widely available than not. Uh, so there's a set of technologies that are sort of undeniably should be permissible, and there's a set of technologies that are pretty undeniably should not be permissible, surreptitious uh, infection so malware infection software, um, and, you know, tools to block circumvention tools, things like that, and that list exists as well, as Colin mentioned. Most technology is neither of those, is, is this dual-use technology, and in, in order for personal communication technology to work, you need to have networks, and networks are made of 
routers and a lot of networking equipment that can be used for really, really good things and can be used for really, really bad things. And so that's where it begins to get really tricky, uh, particularly for companies that are providing these sorts of tools to know, you know, if, if the sanctions policy is, you know, you can, you can sell cookies, but you can't sell cakes. Well, I make Fig Newtons. Which one of these categories do I fall <laughs> into? I mean, there is a, and so you, you can't in a lot of ways fault companies for saying, well, I'm just going to err on the side of caution and not make these tools available at all. Um, but, it, and that's the, 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 the very tricky uh, set of issues that, that we're negotiating. And uh, as Colin was saying, where the field seems to be right now, or we as a community seem to be, is the, you know, the best option is the know your, know your user, <laughs> you know, know, know not just what technology you're selling, but who you're selling it to and how it's likely to be used, and that that is an obligation that, that, we're, that we believe that, that people who sell technology should have. All right, we can, we can do one last question, and then I'm required to let you all leave the room, so. Write it up. That's right. Real quickly, um, what's the next steps for the paper after Maybe this? We can also get his question and then yeah, we can, then we can answer which one we like better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, Mohammad Najim from SMEX. Uh, I have a one thing to say before I ask my question. I talk to a lot of people from Syria and other countries, and there many of them they know the the issue of the security from using these tools and these technologies, but many of them as well prefer to be connected than being safe. So that's also another another layer of uh, discussion. My question is, uh, I've been reading about this topic since 2009, 2010, and uh, nothing has been really moving a lot on this issue. Uh, is there an advocacy campaign that's really moving and solving um, each topic and each obstacle so we can reach the, the removing on the sanction on uh, technology for users? So um, uh, I guess what, what I'll say is that um, next steps uh, for us, so we're hoping, and I think you know, we've, we've had a really rich discussion here this morning and, and gotten on a, a bunch of interesting topics in terms of um, uh, what's left to be done, which is that we've seen some really positive policy change. There, there's other things that need to go. And, and that uh, it's clear that you know, that doesn't come from just from civil society or just from the companies, but that this is actually a concerted effort. And so um, what, what we're hoping to see is, um, you know, the groups, uh, the, the human rights groups and the activist groups that have really, in a lot of ways, led the charge in terms of making the case for why this is a, a problem in Iran and in other countries to, to continue to make that case and to, to make it louder um, so that it, so that it you know, becomes more of an issue that has to be dealt with. And that goes along with uh, the educational aspect and, you know, working with, with folks in government and other people to um, to really understand the issue and what the policy solution looks like, um, that's a that's a hard thing where, where we want we would like to facilitate and help where we can. Uh, this is you know from the, the Open Technology Institute, um, but also really you know work with all these other incredible groups that are that are doing this um, and that are trying to you know figure out how um, how to really push the policy forward. And so that you know in a couple of years when we're having this conversation, it's actually a different conversation because we've we've moved on from this. Did you? Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Tamora. I'm uh, the core author of the report. In many ways, this event is also a call for action. Um, so if anyone in the audience and uh, also listening to this event is interested in uh, helping to implement some of the recommendations that are outlined in the report, please come see any uh, of the panelists. Um, and we have some ideas, but are very open to other ideas as well. Uh, so in many ways, this event is also a call for action and uh, hoping to get getting other people interested in this topic to, to make this happen. And I, I will add, it's, it's an iterative process um, in terms of understanding it, in terms of pushing the policy solution. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Um, with that uh, in mind, we are over time. So um, I'd like to thank all of you in the audience once again for coming. And of course, to our panelists, uh, Ian, Colin, Brad, and Anwar, for taking the time to join us and for sharing uh, their different experiences. Um, if you have, you know, we're welcome to, if you have more questions, to talk to us uh, privately after or, or follow up. Uh, and please have a wonderful day. Thank you. <laughs>